lecture and support begins in three, two, one. I have a very bad feeling about this. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Nurture and Support, a recommendation podcast sharing all the awesome since 2013. I'm Kelly Tool at K-E-L-L-Y-T-H-U-L on Twitter. And with me, as always, decking the halls with the Amazon Prime Directive <laughs> is Mel. Hey, everybody. I'm Mel. I might change my name to Darth Mel. I don't know. At Karmic9 on Twitter. And here we are, squeeing about Star Wars. Yes, again. indeed. So we're... Uh, Certainly, you can listen to us whenever you want to and get to, and anytime you do, we appreciate it, but we will be releasing this particular episode on Christmas morning, so when you're opening your presents, you can open up Nurture and Support and listen along as you open your presents. So, special one today, uh, we're going to just talk about whether we will or won't recommend uh, Star Wars 7, The Force Awakens. It's a tough call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that movie was any good. I really don't know. Hmm. Kind of eats hmm. my, uh, it will. So, fair warning before we get started, we we will be talking about probably every inch of this movie. <laughs> so, it, there's a plot point, a development. If you have not seen it, shame on you, and go see it. Spoiler alert for the recommendation part. But uh, we will be talking about it all. So, if that is, if you do not want that information in advance of seeing the movie, then I recommend you return to your presence. Maybe have some eggnog and come back and listen to us after you after you've seen the show. Yes, which will be very soon, I'm sure, because you know Disney needs more money. <laughs> That's right. They <They'd laughs> only we promoted this. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know how this is. You know, setting all sorts of records from a box office point of view. I just don't see how the Rogue One or Episode Eight stands a chance to perform anywhere close the same level well i mean you know this this gave the um the whole franchise a good kick i mean you know there's a ton of people out there who love star wars but may have become quite disillusioned with it like me after the prequels and uh, i think this movie will re-energize things get people more hopeful i guess i should say a new hope for the future Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, probably couldn't be the working title for it. New Hope for future episodes if you're going to see it. Yes. So, um, so spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Uh, so if you're still listening and you don't want spoilers, uh, what are you doing here? Go away. Yes, yes. Um, turn it off. So speaking of spoilers, leading up to it, uh, we were Mel and I were talking before we started recording, and she mentioned that she just steered clear of everything possible, articles, commentary for months leading up to this to keep things as pure as possible. And then you mentioned there were a few things that you found out were fairly common knowledge that you didn't know about. I'd be real interested. What are a couple of those things that... that well, at the very beginning of The Force Awakens, we're introduced to a character who actually f speaks the first lines of the movie. And that character is never named. I don't think he's ever named actually in the movie. And um, he, of course, is a famous actor, Max von Sydow. And or I don't know how you say his last name. I probably butchered that. But, you know, everybody knew he was going to be in the movie. And I actually, I guess I had tuned out by the time all of that started coming around. But one of the things that I had no clue about was that a lot of people thought that the character that he was going to be playing was going to be an older Boba Fett. Oh. Now there's still a lot of speculation as to his who his character is and what does Melissa do when she doesn't know what's going on? She buys a book. <laughs> and I bought the novelization of this movie hoping wow. to get some answers. Okay, so his character in the movie is Lor San Tekka. And um, he is the older man who, spoiler, spoiler, gives a little, a, looks like a, oddly enough, like a USB drive. Yeah, yeah it, <laughs> that, that doesn't need to be plugged, it just needs to be in the drawer, apparently. Yes. They've come a long way with technology, sort of. Yes, yeah. He gives, he gives this important piece of a map to Poe, 
the pilot. And shortly after, Kylo Ren shows up and things, you know, things are going to go bad then. But uh, we're not, we're never really told much about this character except in the opening crawl that he is an old ally. I don't remember the exact wording, but we're yeah. never told much about him. And so there was a lot of speculation that who he actually was playing was an older Boba Fett. It does not look like that is true because I believe the official description of him is that he is a legendary traveler and explorer and a follower of the Church of the Force. So while he is not a Jedi, he is a follower of the Jedi, a believer in the Force. And so we still don't know his backstory which seems to be pretty common in this movie that we're introduced to a whole lot of people and we don't know who they are or what their story is. Nope. And we get little, we get little tastes here and there. Um, I did. So we kind of, and pretty quickly the, what I, what I'm going to assume are the, the basis of the next three movies. Some of the main characters that are going to play a role between Ray Finn and um, Poe are all introduced fairly, fairly early on. And the one thing I'm like super excited about is I really like all these characters. <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm, I'm, I got, I don't know exactly what they did, but they were successful in that I cared. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted good things to happen for them. I was worried that bad things were going to happen. Uh, and, and they were likable and relatable. I thought. Right. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. I liked all of them. And I can be pretty judgmental. In fact, I was very judgmental about the prequels <laughs> and couldn't watch them because I hated a particular person in them. Um, but, yeah, I didn't I, – I, I hated the right people in this movie. I hated the people that you were supposed to hate in this movie. And I'm really curious, Kelly, how did you feel about Kylo Ren? So I had a chance to talk to, talk to Gene some about this, too, and um... – so I so I I I like Kylo Ren as a bad guy. I think they did some nice things to establish that he is a little young. I, there's been a lot of folks kind of saying like should have kept the mask on. When you see him without the mask, he's just like a kind of a whiny teenager. I've been arguing that he's kind of like a Jonas Brothers uh, cover band <laughs> look alike, uh-huh. and uh, but he still looked a little deranged even even with that. But I think. You know, with the proper scarring, which I think by the end of the movie they've headed down the road to kind of, you know, mess him up a little bit. Um, he'll he'll be a good villain. I do recommend he keeps the mask on. I think he's a lot more badass with the mask on than the mask off. But um, yes, they ought to let him grow some facial hair because if you see him with his little um, his little tufts of chin hair and his little mustache, he looks much more villainy <laughs> than than he did in this movie. But I kind of think that's the point. I think that's kind of what they were going for is because he is kind of like a whiny punk kid. But to me, my personal view on him uh, is he was a lot scarier to me than Darth Vader was because Darth Vader was a controlled and he may have been a bad guy, but he was an honorable bad guy. And I don't think Kylo Ren is particularly honorable because he's not he's not trained. Um, he's a punk. He's a kid. He has terrible fits, t- terrible tantrum fits. And I don't trust that he would, um, I-, I don't know. What, what do you, what do you call it? I'm, I'm getting all of my, um, D and D, uh, categories. Cha- mixed chaotic, in. chaotic evil. He is definitely chaotic evil. Whereas Vader was more lawful evil to me. Yeah, you know, he force choked a lot of people, but yeah. you know he didn't have a tantrum when he did it. <laughs> so well, I mean, so there's the guy, pers- you know, uh, uh, when they when they first land on the ship, and he's got holding the guy up. Where is the princess? Right. Kind of crushes. He had his neck. reason though. He, he had reasons, know. but he, you know he right. didn't have to crush his neck and throw him away. He had, I'm not going to use the situation, but but he yeah. didn't sound angry and like a pissy little kid when he did it. The, t- the, the tantrums are interesting because there were, we had multiple occurrences of tantrums, but that's mm-hmm. also a little bit, I mean, if, I guess, you know, if you're Sithy, <laughs> being kind of your emotions, mm-hmm. I guess. Right. But, but to me, we never saw Vader ever act like that. No. We never saw Vader ever do something like that. And to me, that sort of um, unreliability makes Kylo Ren 
scarier because you don't know what he's going to do. And um, you, uh, you know, to me that that added an extra level of disturbing to his character because he is more disturbed than I think Vader ever was. So what about Snoke? Well, I didn't find him particularly scary, but we don't know very much about him. In my reading that I've been trying to catch up on the last couple of days, I did see, and who knows, because all of this is speculation. There's almost every character in in this movie we know nothing about. So now speculation runs rampant. We're waiting to be filled in on other movies and on all of the books that are coming out. But I saw where there are there's a lot of speculation that Snook is actually Darth Plagueis. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some, and that was the because I I tried to steer clear of uh, spoilers. I wasn't as um, studious as you were in doing it. I poke around on a few articles, but I was really trying to avoid them, except for one jerk on Google Plus that three day you know before the I guess the day the movie came out posted the shot of of Han doubling over with the kind of with a flood of red around him. Oh, and, and I killed that guy. And wrote underneath it Kylo Ren kills Han Solo and put it into Google Plus where you know if you're in Google Plus you're in this stream of photos, right. boom, that's in the middle of my page. I have no choice, you know, so You can't stop from seeing that. Can't can't. Yeah. That's so, an ass. Right that, there. Yeah, that is. Uh, we should probably I should go look his name up. We should include it in the blog. <laughs> Here's a good person to, to block or whatever on Google Plus. But just yeah. uh, from there. But um, but the, but that was about you know some of the, the other spoilers. But I had started to see a little bit of the Darth. You know, is is um, mm-hmm. is Snoke Darth Darth play just I. He's obviously I, not not human. And from actually their actual description of him is he's not supposed to be human. But another cool thing I saw is they briefly considered making Snook a female, which I oh. think would have been cool. I wish they would have done that. That would have been cool. They did, you know, one of the things that Star Wars has not been particularly adept at is developing kind of strong, meaningful mm-hmm. female character. And Princess Leia mm-hmm. was a strong character, was central, but it was that. Yeah. She was that. And by the end of Return of the Jedi, I think there were only two other women ever shown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so she'd have a lot of company. No. Where this one, you know, I am, oh. I am, I am in love with the Ray character just in terms of not the creepy kind of thing, which is I say I'm highly, <laughs> I'm highly enthusiastic. Not in a Kylo Ren kind of love. Not way. in a not in a Kylo Ren kind of love way. Not in the mildly disturbing moment I had with the girl playing Catwoman on Gotham. <laughs> None of that. <laughs> This is just I I heard, I find I just really like her character mm-hmm. a lot. I think I think there's just all kinds of fronts and that you know and it's not entirely fair to kind of keep going back to the prequels and compare and contrast. But I do think you know these have created a different feeling. At least for me, this movie's mm-hmm. created a different feeling moving forward than the prequels did. In that uh, these are characters I care about, and I can't think of any characters in the prequels that I really ever got particularly invested in at all. And yeah. pretty quickly, they got me invested in 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 the, in the main three on the good side here. Right, we cared about Finn. Um, you know, our he's hilarious our def- by the way. Our defector. I mean, he's great. I love him. And so now, you know, we have to uh, we have to wonder where he came from, where he's going, and what role he's going to play in all of this. And so, of course, the the shipping I've seen. <laughs> Has already been going. Who who's going to hook up? Is it going to be Ray and Finn? And nobody's really. I haven't seen a lot of people throwing Poe out there. But like I said, I bought the novelization trying to figure some stuff out. I specifically wanted to read the novelization to try and figure out that Force vision that she had, and was ultimately disappointed. But I'll, I'll throw out since I brought up this whole shipping factor is that at the very end of that book, when she meets Poe, there's a little bit of something there, which I didn't notice in the movie. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to buddy. Yeah, did she waters. even meet Poe in the movie? I don't know. See, I need to see the movie again. Yep. I need to see the movie a few more times um, because so much happened. That mo- The movie is so fast-paced that it flies by. There was a, and it's possible that she didn't. They cut a lot of things out. There, all of the deleted scenes that I'm sure that we'll get on the DVD um, are still in the book. So the book's helpful. You know, it's not some great work of literary, um, you know, 
literature, but it does help give you a little tiny bit more information than you got from watching the movie, trying to clarify a few things. So there were a few scenes that were in the book that were not included in the movie that didn't make the final cut. And that may have been one of them. She meets she meets Poe and I think it says something about she likes the look of his face. And I'm uh, like, oh, are we saying Poe's a hottie? <laughs> Finn's going to wake up one of these days, yeah. little girl. <laughs> Finn's got a little bit of crush on you. He does, <laughs> so, a little bit. And, yeah. and, but he was, and, and the other big thing that I'm a huge fan of, and it just became so clear to me in watching this versus the prequels, is the return of good humor. In, yes. in it, it's just actual moments where you laugh, where there are attempts right. to be humorous in the prequels to yeah. mixed results right. and much more slapsticky and, and basis. But this, you know, and it was almost like right out of the gate. You know, you've got, you know, yeah. Poe Post. and Ren. And say, so am I supposed to talk? Are you supposed to talk? I love that part. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, was just, it was really, really cool. And, and Finn was just, you know, hilarious with, you know, I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> and, and the whole... <laughs> The whole scene of her wanting things to repair the Falcon, and he's trying to figure it out, and yes. she's like, "The one I'm pointing to, the one I'm pointing to," yes. and he can't figure. It. And it was it was all great. Yeah. Um, so good, good, funny stuff. And yes. C-3PO is actually funny again, <laughs> who was not funny in the prequels, in my opinion. But yeah. I just love that scene towards the end where you've got Han and Leia, special reunited moment. You know, it's all building, and all of a sudden. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? Got a red yeah. arm. <laughs> probably wondering about this. You probably didn't recognize me with my red arm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was great. I did really miss R2, though. I really did. BB-8 is cute and all, but he's not R2. Not to me. I'm old. I, so I thought, uh, you know, for, and R2 did it, you know, the they, they pulled it off with R2 in the original, well, they pulled it across really all of the movies so far, mm -hmm. for him to kind of emote, you know, for, yeah. A thing that just beeps and it's made out of metal to kind of emote is pretty impressive. Uh -huh. And I thought with you know, BB-8, you could do that too. You, you know, you saw a lot of, yes. and a lot of it was with the sounds. And he's kind of a little puppy doggy, and he almost has the right. little dog head cock thing going. Yeah. Uh, but it was it's cool. And they demonstrated how he could go down steps, which yes, was that good did to work. See. That worked. That worked well because I watched that. I was like. Yeah, is he just going to, like, you know, glide down those steps? But no, no, they did it well. It was a really good it was a really good touch they put in there because they, they could have easily just ignored it. Yeah, which is what they used to do with R2 all the time because technology wasn't. But they didn't show him going back up. No. <laughs> which I think might have been more of, you know. More difficult. Some of them might have been pushing him kind of up a step or something like that. Yes, because they do, they do make several references to him not having any appendages um, in the book, you know, bringing it up as far as the things that he's capable of doing because he doesn't, you know, his value, um, you know, in the, in the scene on um, Jakku that the, uh, that junk dealer is trying to buy him yep. in, in the book, they cut it out of the movie in the book. They do specifically mention that, you know, he doesn't have any appendages. So his usefulness is, you know, not that great, but I'll buy him from you anyway. So, um, but, <laughs> and speaking of, you know, that scene when um, he, he uh, talking about BB-8 having the ability to emote where he does a thumbs up with yeah. a little blowtorch. <laughs> that was, that was cute. Some people might think that was hokey, but at the moment, it, it just really fit the moment really well. I, so. I, that was, um, that was one of the moments I laughed out loud <laughs> in the theater because I just, I just liked it. I just thought it was, I know it's kind of not, it's not cheap, but it was yeah. just, but it was, it was great. And it was just well thought out and executed. And because I was already liking all these characters, it was just mm -hmm. all so much easier for me to, to get a good, and that whole scene had had so much kind of fun stuff going on in it. I was primed to continue to enjoy it more. Right, right. Where he's having to appeal to the joy, the joy to not, not give his secret away. <laughs> yeah, secret. Like, I don't know about this. I don't know. <laughs> like you. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was it. It obviously everyone you can tell that we both really enjoyed this movie. It was. Um, it was what I was looking forward to. I wasn't, I, well, I'll take that back. I was disappointed. I was getting ready to say I wasn't disappointed by anything in this movie, but I was. I was. Can you guess, Kelly? 
you wanted to see Jar Jar in the line of people on the planet that got evaporated. That would have been nice. Yes, I read up there. <laughs> yeah. No, I've been going on and on about Captain Phasma. How freaking cool Captain yeah. Phasma is. What'd she get? Three sentences? Three sentences and a body check by Chewbacca. <laughs> a big one. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, in my research today of trying to catch up on a bunch of the articles that I haven't been reading, um, she plays a much bigger role in the next movie we have been promised. So, you know, we don't actually see her die or be disposed of though there is mention of a trash compactor yes, <laughs> which cool. was a funny which was a funny moment but yes so we can assume that she has survived um the destruction of star killer base and will reappear as a i believe somebody one of the people associated with uh with the movie called her a a big baddie so i'm hoping she gets her chance to be bad yeah, because it was because the buildup was you you kind of anticipated her having a bit of a bigger a bigger yeah. role. She's in all of the posters. They had Halloween costumes. I have a Funko from of her. I have a poster. <laughs> I have all sorts of things about Captain Phasma, and she was in the movie for three minutes. Yeah. But so. Boba Fett, you know, same, you know. I know. Yeah. Sometimes a little bit things could pick up a little bit more, and they, right. I think they're I think they they will. But and that's my. I enjoyed this. I didn't think the movie was perfect. Uh, it's yeah. very hard to be perfect. Right. Uh, and and the part where I really struggled was at the at the very end, just the kind of wrap up point. Felt like certain things were just kind of well, isn't that convenient? Isn't that convenient? Because Ray kind of defeats Kylo Ren and is mm. you know a, a beat away from taking him out when Starkiller Base starts it's rending funny. apart. And way at one beat, they're five feet apart. Right. At the next beat, they're 25 feet apart, and I did not get the sense that the ground had opened up and spread 20 feet. So that distance thing kind of bugged me. And then followed by the Millennium Falcon happens to show up right away to pick them up. Okay, maybe mm-hmm. I get that. But then, you know, back at uh, at uh, Bad Guy Central, they're like, oh, you know, uh, Snoke is going, time for you guys to go get Kylo Ren. How do they know where he is? How do they get to him? So because it doesn't seem like, there's a whole lot of time from when that big split occurs to when everything kind of goes, and they've got to get him. They got to get Phasma out of the trash compactor. <laughs> and She's get, awesome enough that she got herself out of that trash compactor. Yeah. Telling you, that's she true. Didn't need anybody to rescue her? There you go. Fair enough. She yeah, she found her way out. Okay, I'll go with. I can definitely go with that. So okay. either either somehow the trash compactor is such a well constructed device that when this whole thing blows up, it, it, it just survives. floats free in space with enough atmosphere to hold her until yes. she's radio for help. That's right. That's an instance where the book handles that whole timeline a little bit better. The fight actually happens slightly differently in the book than they actually filmed it. Um, he's actually in, in the novelization um, cause in the movie, you've got the, the planet ripping apart and these big fissures open up in the, in the ground. And, you know, at one point she was trapped against one and then she just, you know, reimagined her force powers and pushes him back. And then another one opens up between them, separating them, basically keeping her from being able to give a killing blow to him in the novelization. She actually, one can assume that it's Snook, she actually sort of hears a voice telling her to kill him, um, and she backs away from it, and he is actually, they have already sent them to get him. He has a tracker on him, which is how they found him, and um, that they pick him up. So in the novelization, the chain of events happens a little bit differently. In the movie, she leaves on the Millennium Falcon and they've left him on the ground separated from the Fisher but it happens a little different in the movie so you have to wonder you know how much they're going to stick to all of that because the movie I'm sure will trump the novelization because they cut parts out and they changed it so but you know it's one of those minor minor details I suppose that they won't bother to really worry about and Poe made it all the way through to the end of the book yes yeah because that was was interesting because early versions, um, and this is actually coming from the the actor, 
was, mm-hmm. hey, you want to be in Star Wars? Say, oh, this is really cool. And JJ's talking to him, yeah, you're going to be this, you're going to be this great starfighter. And yeah, it's great, it's great. Uh, and then we're going to kill you. You're going to die. And I think the intent was his arc was going to be that when the TIE fighter went down, mm-hmm. he died He died then. And then the story went on. But right. they, they started seeing, wow, he's kind of adds care. a lot. He's a good Charismatic. Character. Yeah. People are going to like him. Kind of like a Jesse Pinkman kind of thing. <laughs> it's like, yeah, maybe right. this guy should stick around a little bit. And so J.J. got back a hold of him and says, well, I don't, don't worry. I've worked it all. I figured it all out. We tweaked some things. You're back in for the whole movie. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know what the timing would be between script rewrites and the book and, and all of that. So he he was in the whole book and they briefly that the part that they skip over in the movie was him making it from the crash to all of a sudden in the movie. He's back at the rebel base um, in order, you know, saving them on. I forget the name of the planet they were on the green planet with uh, the pirate. Moss. Planet. Yeah. Katanka, whatever her name is. I think it's she, the Caribbean because it's the Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> so, it's the it planet Caribbean. It definitely looks like that. Yeah, so he's in his his X-Wing when they, um, yeah, to save them, basically. And he, there's a big gap in between there. They briefly cover him making it to a town on Jakku. And then they skip over the part where he makes it back to the rebel base. But they did briefly cover that in the book. So, yeah, there was um, there was quite a lot about him in the in the book. Pretty much the, this novelization was a little better than some of the others that I've read. But, uh, you know, they're basically just based off the screenplays. But um, one of the things, if you're a listener of this show and you listen to our last Star Wars episode where I talked about the book Aftermath, I told you there was going to be a character. I hoped there was going to be a character show up in this movie from that book. And there was. You'll never guess who it was, though, because they kind of changed his name. He's going by a nickname in the movie. He was a pilot. (laughs) I thought for a while when the movie first started, because, like I said, I had avoided knowing anything about any of this. I really didn't even know about (laughs) Poe. I I knew about Finn. I knew about Ray, But I didn't really know about Poe. Um, And when Poe first appears on the screen, I'm thinking that it was Timon Wexley from the book Aftermath um, because he was a he was a great pilot and he built robots. And I'm going, this is Timon. He's built this little cute little BB-8 and he's a snarky, sarcastic person. And I'm like, that's him. Well, it's not. But Timon is in the movie. He is called Snap Wexley. And he was played by Greg Grunberg. There you go. That is Timon from the Chuck Wendig book, Aftermath. He is now called Snap. And he actually is mentioned more in the book than you actually mention him so much in the movie. He's there, um, and he actually gets to speak a few times. But um, I was excited, especially when I saw I saw on Twitter the morning before I went to see the movie that I didn't know Greg Grunberg was in it. <laughs> And uh, I saw briefly where he was a pilot. And I was like, that's cool. And then I went and watched it and was like, Snap Wexley, that's Timon. And so I was really looking for Mr. Bones. And I'm disappointed that Mr. Bones was not in the movie, but I have hopes for the next one. There you go. So maybe we'll get Mr. Bones in the next one. Yes. And there is a Snap Wexley action figure. Oh. I just found out. So I need to go try to find that. So you were, were you aware, because I turned myself loose on all the – Easter egg articles and everything else when I, after I'd seen it, things I've been yes. holding off. So you are aware Daniel Craig was in this movie too. And I, I knew it during that scene. I didn't know anything about the Easter eggs. I looked at that article after I saw the movie and I remember, I remember cause when I, I went, I went to see, I took my family to see this. So I, my mom was there. And when, when he started talking, I was telling my mom, I said, that stormtrooper sounds really hot. <laughs> And then I got home and found out it was Daniel Craig, and I was like, hell yeah. Of course he was. <laughs> and I, I will totally drop my tell. gun. <laughs> <laughs> I could totally tell. <laughs> but, yeah, I didn't I didn't catch really any of those Easter eggs on the article that I saw. I never would have guessed that was Simon Pegg um, as that junk dealer. No. Never would have guessed. I don't know how you could. I don't know how you could that. I don't really know. I don't know how you were able to 
to telepathically determine hotness, stormtrooper hotness. <laughs> but <laughs> good call on Daniel Craig. I'm telling you. I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> um, but it was because it was it wasn't just straight Daniel. It was stormtrooper Craig, so it yes. was a little muffled and whatever there. But right. But it was yeah. You have to go listen to that scene. You're hearing that voice, and you're going, "This guy's hot." <laughs> And then it was Daniel Craig, and I was like, ah, I knew it. I knew. Yeah. That was so funny. See, that would be me. I don't care. Put put me in a Stormtrooper outfit. I want to be in the movie. You could kill me. That's fine. Just put me in the movie. So, yeah, the the Easter eggs are pretty cool by all the all the people that were in this movie who have no, bit par- no parts. They're just bit parts. They're there. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yep. And little things like the uh, the practice remote. Uh, for, that Luke used on the Millennium Falcon in the first episode. Uh, again, in one of my favorite scenes, it's when Ray's repairing it, and she's asking for things from Finn. As he's kind of weeding through and grabbing things, one of the things he picks up and looks at and discards is that actual orb. I didn't, now that you say that, I realize that. I did notice him picking up that this round thing, and what is that? But I didn't put that together. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, and I, I didn't catch any of these first viewing. And then, unfortunately, the theater I went to, um, it's a nice theater, and it's one of those things you can, like, order, you know, order food, and they'll come up, and they'll bring you food before the movie, and then the downside is 20 minutes before the movie ends, they're coming to say, hey, you need to kind of sign your credit card receipt and do that. Oh. So they come in, and they give me this stuff, and I'm like, I'm watching it in 3D, so I've got to take the 3D glasses off to sign. It's a little dark, so I've got to grab the phone to kind of give myself some light to see the thing, and then the pen they gave me didn't work. And so, so I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble and and while this is happening, I'm not able to really watch the movie. And so I'm trying to get this stuff done. This is in uh, Kylo Ren's having his latest tantrum. And then all of a sudden I hear the theater erupt in laughter. I'm like, crap, (laughs) because I look up and whatever has happened is gone. And what I missed was the two stormtroopers coming down the hall. Uh He's having the fit. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think so. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I have to go back to see that. So I'm going to have to go back. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a movie that, that really to catch everything, you'd really need to see multiple times, much more so than I think um, even, you know, A New Hope was. The pace of this movie was just so fast. There's so much stuff going on. There's so many things in the background that you know that there's more going on then you can actually just see in a glance. And that's actually, that's what I've heard from all the people who have already gone and seen it multiple times. It's like, you know, they've seen it. They're on their fourth or fifth viewing now and they catch something new every time they go see it. So I, I hate paying movie theater prices. So yeah. the DVD needs to come out really soon. I might go see it once more before it leaves theaters, but um, I don't know. So it is. The, Did you see it in 3D? Yes, so we saw it in Cinemark XD, whatever that is. Yeah, we we were plain old school 3D, uh, <laughs> but it was good. Um, and it is, I mean, a movie of the scope with the type of scenes and and you know, right right out of the gate to start a destroyer blocking off the planet and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, the scale and all that good stuff. So I'm gonna probably try and catch it once or twice more in the theater and then anxiously wait the DVD. Which will probably be out pretty soon. Because I, I believe The Martian just came out. That was the last movie I saw. Yeah. I think it's just released in DVD. Yes, or it's going to next week or something. I don't know. It's like going to be here any minute. And like that was the last actual movie I saw in the theater. So it'll be pretty soon. Unless Disney wants to keep it in the theaters longer to try to rake in more of our money. Which is entirely possible. Uh, would not be against their character <laughs> to, yes. to want to do that. And it will work because, yeah. you know, we're out there. You can't hardly find it now that the movie's actually opened. It was bad when all the Star Wars toys first came out. But you can't hardly find a Star Wars anything <laughs> in the store right now. Yeah. I mean, even even the DVD sets of the prequels are gone. <laughs> and that's pretty bad. <laughs> but, yeah, and I'm, well, I'm never Star wars listening in the house because I've got, you know, I've got VHS tapes of, Mm -hmm. I think I actually have the VHS tapes of the ones before Lucas started messing with them. So I have the original originals. (laughs) Uh, Then I had a a remastered VHS version, then jumped over to 
DVDs of all of them, and then got the Blu-ray, the Blu-ray collection. But my main DVD collection is on loan to somebody who wanted to get through all of them, yeah. and my Blu-ray collection is on loan to somebody who wants to get all of them. I'm, I'm like, crap, I kind of, I'm a little light on Star Wars stuff right now. <laughs> yeah, I have the. I want to say I think it's the 2008 version of the original trilogy, which, um, because if you follow me on Twitter, you may have noticed I did an original trilogy marathon Saturday before I saw the movie on Sunday. And um, I I didn't check my discs well enough, and I put in the remastered ones. That that 2008 DVD set that has Luke and, and Vader having a lightsaber fight on the front that actually has the original theatrical version of the movie now these aren't blu-rays they're just dvds but on the bonus disc but i was putting in the main disc and um having so, to suffer through the cgi so, so more do backs for you <laughs> yeah do backs for everyone you get a do back and you get a do back you know, and I have, I, I'll admit it, okay, I think the do-backs are cool, but not the CGI do-back crap in the movie. That was bad. But I have the Funko do-back do Stormtrooper <laughs> set. Yeah, do-backs are cool. I, I yes. think they, you know, they were fine the way they were. Yeah, and actually, you know, I was talking to someone about that the other day when I was complaining about all the added CGI, is that really um, they added so much to most Eisley that it was so packed and I that may have been the idea they were going for but I liked it when it was more like a desert wasteland sort of town where everybody was inside they weren't on the streets um, I thought that gave it a much better a much better gunslinger old west type feel yep. to the town than cramming it with all that CGI crap I mean I was that's just a bad choice in my opinion but yes yeah, yeah the only uh, I think the the only thing that was actually improved was the Wampa for me in the whole whole sequence of things. I do think, okay, I could see, and they struggled mightily with the effects for the Wampa when they actually filmed it. Yeah. So, so I thought that that addition, I was okay, you know, that that actually, okay, that actually, you know, makes the scene a little better. But everything else just seemed gratuitous to me. It was just more, more, more. Yeah, and the the extra scenes they did of the Tauntauns, I'm like, my rage at messing <laughs> with the puppets just knows no bounds, you know. And I was like, that's bad CGI. Y'all just need to leave that crap alone. And then when I was watching Return of the Jedi, I haven't ever actually, I don't know that I've ever really watched Return of the Jedi again. I know it's got shield generators in it, Kelly, but I'm there you sorry. Go. That's key. Um, Always key. I don't, I don't know that I'd ever watch Return of the Jedi again all the way through. Um, I've watched, you know, up into the important, important parts, and then I usually end up, you know, turning it off during the Ewok celebration and everything. But did they add a bunch of more CGI Ewok stuff at the end? Did they? Because I didn't remember it being that hokey. They, they added additional celebration scenes. Yes. Okay, uh, I thought they did because it looked totally. The, I mean, it was completely CGI'd with them around little fires. Yep. Little yeah, CGI'd fires. That was the dumbest thing I have ever seen. And and they had you know Naboo and additional scenes of Coruscant and I think Bespin's right. in there too. Oh yeah, yeah. And and they had a little bit in the original one. There was there was a touch to say you know it's many people are celebrating, yes. but uh, the the only upside on that is. The Yub Yub song, or the Yub Nub song, yeah. actually was a fatality of that. Those additional scenes meant the reduction of the Yub Yub, Yub song. So okay. I'm okay with that. I'm very much okay with that. I never had a problem with the Ewoks. I didn't. I, I thought they were cute when I was a kid, and I still retain. I still retain that teddy bear cuteness as an adult. I still don't have a problem with the Ewoks. So and I would have much rather that have been a Wookiee planet, but. That would be cool, and I wish they would really do that. Maybe we'll get that someday. Because some of the history in between Return of the Jedi and this movie, you know, depending on what they're going to go back and show us or tell us, is, um, you know, Chewie and Han in, in Aftermath, in the book I talked about last week, the very brief scene they have of Han in that book, he and Chewie get the opportunity to go back and help um, free Chewie's people from Kashyyyk. Cool. And um, 
in in the intervening time frame they succeed in that chewy succeeds in that so that was a neat touch i would love for them to actually do more movies um on wiki planet that would be, cool. be cool so my last my last quibble I hate to finish on a downer but one other quibble <laughs> since you brought it up uh -oh. how is it possible that Han has not had an opportunity to use Chewie's bowcaster until this this show. <laughs> you know, as as long as they've been for him to go. Wow, I like this. This is good. Like, this is the gun this guy has had forever. You're telling me yeah. you've never had a chance to to shoot mm -hmm. that thing and see how cool it was. That yeah. was one thing that I found, and I don't know, I don't know how true this is, but one thing that I did see. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, Han using the bowcaster doesn't happen in the novelization. So they added that in, I think, for the funny effect. Yep, which was movie. funny. Okay. It was funny. They haven't been together for a long period of time. He, um, What I read was that Chewie, when he freed his planet, he went back to his home world. And Han was a married family man at home with Leia. And it wasn't until... Um, Kylo Ren screwed everything up that Han left and returned to his life of smuggling and Chewie um, hooked back up with him again for that. So I was I was read that, you know, there was a long period of time in there that they were not together. But yes, at some point you would think that Chewie would have let him shoot the bowcaster. You would have thought. Somewhere it's just, but it was still cool. It was fun. Another one of the fun moments. I mean, the Harrison Ford stuff was pretty awesome. A lot of really good humor there. Again, there, everybody yes. that did humor. Poe did a little bit of humor. Finn did a ton. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Daisy Ridley Ridley was yeah. uh, she's she. You know, I liked I, I liked her. I liked her acting. She could be mm -hmm. funny. The don't hold my hand stuff was pretty fun. Yeah, that was funny. Uh, and so it's cool. But, uh, now that you want to talk about quibbles, though, that's one of my quibbles. Is I love Finn's character. But he seems to be rather chivalrous in that scene. He keeps grabbing her hand, trying to lead lead her away. He seems to have all of these these feelings about helping people. He's been stolen and brainwashed and raised by the First Order all of his life. Where would he have gotten these feelings from? Where would he have gotten these these sort of chivalrous notions in his head from? And that's one of those things where we don't know we don't know where he comes from. Um, there's apparently a book out. I don't know the name of it, um, but it's technically it's it's part of the whole journey to the Force Awakens thing that tells. It's a book of short stories, and it has I guess just three short stories: one about Finn, one about Poe, and one about um, Ray to try to give you some background on their characters from a time frame before the movie starts. And apparently that one is supposed to give you a little bit more background about Finn, but I don't think they tell you still where he comes from because in the movie he says he doesn't know his parents. He doesn't have a name and all of that. So that was just one of my quibbles is where did he get all these values? Because he hadn't been raised with them. That's for right. sure. Fair. I missed that. Yeah, good point. I mean, where did he get this? That was my only problem is that he seems to be a pretty honorable guy. And then all of the taking her hand thing, like she needs help, you know, let's let's help the poor little desert girl to lead her to safety. Where did he get these notions from? I I think there may have been a little bit. Let me help my soon to be girlfriend. <laughs> you know, I think yes. there, I think there was a little bit of I think there was a little bit of that. It might not have all been chivalrous. A little bit might have been. Yes, I I know, but still, you know, he's he's been and they talk about it. Um, yeah. But, they're they're using the brainwashing a lot. That word a lot in the novelization of how the stormtroopers are raised. They touch on it in the in the book when especially Kylo talks about um, maybe we should be using clones since they can't control the stormtroopers and one of them has defected but they've never had a stormtrooper defect ever he's the first one so you have to wonder I, I just wonder it's one of those things I'm like where did he get these notions in his head from he just woke up one day and decided I'm not gonna kill people anymore though this was apparently supposed to be his first mission yeah so I'm like wow I don't know he looks a little old for this to be his first mission. 
Yeah, he, he must have been like in the remedial classes or something like well, that. He, they he got him as a, a kid. Yeah. He, he was a janitor, which I really love that. He's a space janitor, and here he is saving the rebellion. <laughs> and who knows? Who knows if he's going to uh, be a Jedi in the future? You know, that that's one of those cool things where we don't – we don't know what's going to happen. Nope. And for the first, that's kind of for the first time we don't know what's going to happen because the prequels are all dealing with things where we knew where that story was going to end. Yeah. We may not have known some of the details, but we knew where that story was going to end. So, you know, that was one of the things I didn't like about it because I, I kind of felt, why do I need to watch this when I know what's going to happen? I may not know the little details in between, but I know he's going to go bad. Why do I want to watch a movie and have you make me care about this person when he's going to go bad and destroy everybody he loves? I didn't kind understand that. Kind of a problem. I, yeah, I didn't understand that. But that's one of the things I like about this is we don't know. We don't know anything about these people. And uh, I, have, I have one other question for you, Kelly. Would you left the movie? Who did you think Ray's parents are? Um. So... I left, I'm trying to think what in terms of timing. Um, I did not, when I left left the theater, I didn't think it was Luke. Mm -hmm. After getting home and kind of pondering a little bit more, we're like, oh, I wonder if it is Luke, <laughs> you know, and kind of thinking back to, boy, she sure seems to have a lot of good Force stuff going, picked it up pretty quick. Uh, mm -hmm. So Force would be strong in a family. Uh, there was, and you know, there were a couple things like the lightsaber, you know, the, and we saw some of the previews, the lightsaber behind the force runs strong in my family. I have it, you know, mm -hmm. you have it. So right. I'm, I, well, I may not have been a hundred percent sure and I'm still not. I tend to think, although I don't know how that happens unless Luke, Luke's a really crappy Jedi. Uh, I'm kind of thinking he's a sky, she's a Skywalker. What about you? Well, when I left the movie, I was absolutely positive that she had to be Luke's. I don't see any way that she could be um, Han and Leia's. Um, that, of course, is a theory that's running around out there. I don't see. I don't see that because Luke would not have made them forget her. I can see her being Luke's and him hiding her because part of that Force vision that's hard to understand what's going on is apparently Kylo Ren and the Knights of Ren killing all of the kids at the Jedi temple that Luke had started to train new Jedi. So it would appear that she may be a survivor of that. And someone has erased her memory of it because she was a young kid. But even if she was Luke's, he, I can see him putting her on a desert planet that nobody might go to, but I don't see him leaving her with no one to take care of her. So that seems like a crappy thing for Luke to do, even if he is a Jedi that's not supposed to be tied down to family ties and things like that. But when I left the movie, I was pretty sure she had to be Luke's. And I still lean in that direction, but I saw another theory that she might be a Kenobi. And that is really rattling around in my head. And That'd I like cool. that. I like it. I like, I like that idea quite a bit because I would love to see this move outside of the Skywalker realm because they're not the only people in the universe that are force sensitive so i would love it if she ends up being a kenobi so i don't know i just i just came across that a little while ago yeah, and i was like i like i, like I, I would idea. actually like i like that idea a lot yeah because you know obi-wan was having a relationship <laughs> with that mandalorian lady so she could be his great his granddaughter and they actually got um they actually got him to do a line in that yeah. force vision so she, he's dead why would his voice be in there uh, only then it's a very confusing vision which was yeah. the whole reason i bought that book was to try to make sense of that vision and it didn't it glossed over the entire thing well, so and that bad. whole sentence about Ren, you've taken the first step. First step. It's Alec Guinness saying Ren. And right. it's um, uh, Ewan McGregor saying, saying the, the rest, rest of it. it. So, yeah. so you've got a couple of versions of Obi-Wan in there, which is a good, strong right. Kenobi representation because Yoda's probably right. not the baby daddy. <laughs> you know, I think, I think no. we're okay there. Uh, no. Qui-Gon, we got a little Qui-Gon, seems to always be a, right. 
a bit of a voice. So that's the other yeah. part I need to go see again to kind of pick up all those voices. Right. Yeah, That that's something that needs to be watched over and over again because I know I completely missed the Knights of Ren reference. I was watching that going, who the hell are all these other guys standing behind him? I, I, didn't, I didn't understand any of that. But I really, the idea of her being a Kenobi, I think would be really, really cool. I'm really liking that idea. Yep, that'd be I think sweet. that would be. I think that would be pretty cool. I would love that. So, well, one of our longer nurture and sports, but it's Star Wars and it's Christmas. Yes. So, Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> Happy yes. holidays. Uh, I believe this ends with us uh, making a recommendation, which would be, I believe, it's pretty clear at this point in time that Mel and I both recommend you yes. see this movie possibly multiple times, and then buy the Blu-ray or DVD. Would love to hear any of your input on on where you think Ren's lineage is. Are you Team Kenobi, Skywalker, uh, Solo, or other? Uh, that'd be kind of interesting to see what the, some of the folks listening think. And uh, I don't know if there's anything else before we... You got something else? Luke, give, you me might. One, give me one second. I actually have a social media recommendation. Oh, my goodness. I yes. know. Shock right. of shock. Okay. I actually have a social media recommendation for this Star Wars related show and it's a Twitter account it is at Kylo R 3 N and the the handle is emo Kylo Ren <laughs> <laughs> and um, I like it but a lot of the stuff that he's that he's tweeting is obviously a little spoilery for those who haven't seen it but yeah that totally sums up Kylo Ren for me he's so emo so there's my social media recommendation for the first time in forever. There you go. Excellent one. So we recommend the movie. We got the social media recommendation from Mel. We're going to hand it over to Nurture and Support's version of Jar Jar Binks at this point in time, Matt. And he's going to tell you all the many different ways that you can connect to us uh, through iTunes, email, websites, etc. cetera. And uh, looking forward to um, visiting with everybody again next week. We'll be back next week, everybody. Thank you for listening to us rattle on about Star Wars, because obviously we're not Star Wars fans at all. Not at all, clearly. If it helps if I got out and pushed. You can contact us on our website, nurtureandsupport.net, or email us at nurtandsup at gmail.com. That's N-U-R-T-A-N-D-S-U-P-P at gmail.com. Or tweet us at nurtandsup on Twitter. You can also catch Nurture and Support on YouTube. Just search Nurture and Support or Kelly Tool. Nurturing and supporting journey.